of course, we had the the um, on Monday night we had the release of two uh, elderly Israeli women from Gaza. They were returned home. Uh, Yochefet uh, Lifshitz and Nurit Cooper, and there was this extraordinary scene. Uh, this video. Uh, this is the video that was released by Qassam showing their release, and then. Um, you know, they're given tea and so on. But then there's this extraordinary moment uh, where uh, that's uh, Yochevet Lifshitz, who's 85 and who is living in um, in a kibbutz near the Gaza border. And so she's being handed over to the Red Cross. And now, and she turns around, turns around, uh, pauses, shakes the hand of the Qassam fighter and says shalom to him. And that video, of course, is now quite famous and caused a lot of a stir, yeah, uh, in Israel. Then she gave a press conference, uh, John, uh, on Tuesday from the Ikhilov Hospital in Tel Aviv, where she was examined. And she was asked, well, among, this has now been widely reported. She said that the, that it was very frightening being, uh, being taken prisoner and, uh, being carried on the back of a motorcycle and it was extremely painful and it sounds like an absolutely horrifying experience and particularly for a lady of that age but then she talks about uh, being taken into a spider web of tunnels uh, we'll get uh, just hold on to that for a second Tamara uh, and include she says a spider web of tunnels and a big hall as as part of this tunnel network we'll come back to that just hold that thought but then, uh, Tamara, come back, come back to that video uh, where she was asked uh, why she, sh she shook the hand of that fighter. This is what she said. Go ahead, play it. Let's play it. And she's, she says, what, why? They say they treated us gently and they provided for all our needs. My mom is saying that they treat them kindly and provided for them. Yeah, so that we can, I think that's enough. We can, we can pause it there. But so uh, she she said of course that the hamas uh, fighters that that they uh treated the 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 captives well that they ate the same food as they did they provided them with medical care and and so on so uh that's just and that caused a huge backlash in israel we've had journalists and uh apparently officials of the propaganda organize you know the Israeli official propaganda Hasbara saying she shouldn't have been allowed to give a live press conference. And uh, her son gave an interview to Israeli television yesterday, I believe, saying that uh, prior to the inter to the press conference, she was coached uh, by Israeli officials on what she should should and shouldn't say, but she just ignored it and decided to say what what was the truth and what was her experience. So that that's just to he bring... he said he said she said she's not property of the state. Exactly. Yeah. yeah, exactly. But coming back to and then keeping in mind her uh her comments or what she revealed about the tunnels. Uh let, let's look at this story that appeared in Middle East Eye yesterday, John. Um now, well, this is something we talked about last uh, on Monday before this came out. This story claims that Israel plans to flood the tunnels with nerve gas. And then if you scroll, scroll the story a little bit um, so we can read the first paragraph or so. Uh, I don't know if we can do that, Tamara, or I can pull it up on my computer. So it says, the first paragraph says, Palestinian groups expect Israel to flood Hamas tunnels with a type of nerf gas or chemical weapon under the surveillance of U.S. Delta Force commandos as part of a surprise attack on the Gaza Strip, a senior Arab source familiar with the Palestinian groups told uh, 
Middle East eye. Now, a couple of the, now what strikes me there is this is not coming from any alleged Israeli or American source, but from a Palestinian source. I don't know what to make of this, John. What do you make of it in terms of how this is phrased and also what it claims could happen, which is uh, this this pumping the tunnels full of, of nerve gas? Yeah, I mean, even if it's a PSYOP, it's a deeply disturbing one. Um, it was a story that we talked about on last show because it was first leaked to Netanyahu's newspaper, the free Sheldon Adelson newspaper that gets uh, the highest circulation in Israel. So it's obviously a PSYOP that they're working on, and then they pass it on to Middle East Eye. So um, I think you could sort of see where it came from, judging by Netanyahu's paper. But um, I, I mean, it's deeply theoretical. I don't... Uh, the there's a bunch of things to say about it. The first thing I'd say is it, it it's assuming that you're clearing the surface level. So it's assuming that you're fighting your way through the Gaza Strip into the tunnel area that you're trying to get to. So it assumes something right away that's very unclear uh, at this point. It's very theoretical. The Israelis themselves say that the tunnels are, their tunnel study is theoretical. Um, because they actually don't have any operational experience in the tunnels. Their soldiers are prohibited from entering the tunnels unless it's been closed at one end. So they don't have any operational experience in the tunnel. Um, that woman, the lady released the other day, has more, much more uh, operational experience in the tunnel than any Israeli soldiers, even, um, even close. So that's the first thing to say. Um, and then it assumes that you're able to stay in that position and hold that position and move up and down through the tunnel because the tunnel is a very difficult um, space to operate in. Like she said, the lady said, it's a spider web. And a spider web implies that you have many turns, many forks. Um, and so even if the soldiers can get down into the tunnel, it's very resource heavy to be down there because you have to guard with two soldiers each tunnel turn of this spider web that she's describing. Your radios don't work. It's dark. Um, your night vision goggles don't work because it's so dark down there. Um, you don't know where you're going. If you send a robot ahead of you, you have to tell the robot where to go. So if you don't know where to go, the robot doesn't know where to go. Um, and so if it was a single objective, as if like we're trying to, the Delta Force are trying to clear out the basement where they're, where they found, say they found the place they want to go, which itself isn't clear. Gilad Shalit was six years in the Gaza Strip and the Israelis admit they never had a clue where he was at any point in that six years. So already we're making enormous assumptions on Israeli capabilities um, that they have never demonstrated before. So say it's one objective, it's one basement, it's one room that they're trying to get. Um, can you do 25 of those? Can you do 40 of those? It takes a company level amount of soldiers to handle these operations, 200 minimum, because the soldiers have to be constantly replaced because it's the air is difficult. It's dark, disorienting. Um, you're, it takes a long time to get down there. The tunnels, um, you know, could be 30, 40, 70 meters deep, like 70 stories down, right? Like um, it's, it's deep under the ground and you're disoriented. The, the air is difficult. And then they have doors. They have doors on these areas um, that lead to the next area. Those doors could be closed and then they have to be breached. So the Israelis have to go down in the tunnel, bring the explosives down with them. In the 2014 war, they were blowing up tunnel entrances with 11 tons of explosives. So now you're bringing all of those explosives from Israel. You're driving them through Gaza, presuming what? Nobody's shooting at these uh, you know, transfers. Um, and then you're taking those extremely dangerous explosives down under the ground and you're creating explosions where your soldiers are, you're risking tunnel collapses, 
the air is terrible um, and your own people that you're in theory trying to to save it sounds like you're trying to kill them if you're going to put nerve gas in there um, are, are down there and that's one that's if it's one tunnel there's 1300 tunnels there's 500 kilometers of the Israelis say 500 kilometers of tunnels and some of them are 70 meters deep so uh, it's just a really difficult uh, thing to imagine and while that's all happening the Palestinians have self-contained units. So they have phone lines that are just for the tunnels. They don't connect outside. They can't be tapped. They're down there with food, fuel, uh, oxygen, ventilation, weaponry. Um, they John, have I all of the advantages. Every single advantage is there underneath the ground. I think we can... Sorry, John. I think we, we have a uh, there was a video that was released of the tunnels recently, um, which I think we can play. Um, let's play it and then we can talk about it. Right, so that's a Soraya Al Quds video, and you can see I'm from just, there. Uh, I'm the, just sorry, the John, tunnels... to interrupt just for those who didn't understand it. The, that Soraya Al Quds, the uh, Islamic Jihad's military wing, and at the end of that video, they say "Ahlan wa sahlan bikum," so they're saying to the Israelis, "You know, welcome. We're waiting for you." So it's kind of taunting them. Yeah, and the lights are on. When the Israelis come, they'll turn the lights off, so it'll be total darkness. And you see those that for the fork that that they walk around. You, when they turn the corner, if the Israelis are going down there with men, they need to every everyone every one of those turns needs to be defended. So the soldiers that do actually make it down into the tunnel and they're moving through the tunnel, disoriented, pitch black no radios, counting their footsteps to try to figure out which ways north, south, east, or west. Uh, Palestinians all know where those tunnel turns are. And when the Israelis reach each turn, they have to leave a soldier to guard that flank, right? So each soldier that is coming down has to guard each one of those turns or else they're going to be ambushed from behind. The tunnels are designed for that purpose. They're designed ultimately uh, for protection, but with the understanding that there's going to be an attacking force in theory, like the Israelis say, in theory, they have no operational experience doing this, um, that they'll be attacked. So you have to assume, which we don't know, but you'll have to assume that there's booby traps, that there's false doors, that there's fake entrances that they spend time and resources trying to blow up where there's nothing behind it. Um, any kind of decoys like that. The whole time they're doing this, they're at the risk of mass casualty. Their own gas, they're carrying their own gas down into this tunnel. Um, they get trapped in a room holding their gas. It's not clear that that's even possible. There's 1,300 tunnels, 500 kilometers of it. I don't think that you can have uh, air sealing on uh, a seal of the air enough to for gas to penetrate something that's uh, half the size of the New York subway system. It just seems I like see. we're talking in real deep theory about the gas. But in talking about this disgusting story about the gas, we can learn about the tunnels and we can also understand what Israel senses um, because that's their dream scenario, um, that brutal war crime that the world would talk about for generations, gassing people underground. Um, that that's that's something that they're thinking about because they don't have any idea what to do with this strategic uh, objective in front of them. Even each tactical stage, when you listen to subterranean soldiers, special forces talk about this stuff, the Americans have special forces, subterranean units to um, to prepare for fighting in North Korea, where they have you know probably the best underground network. 
uh, we don't know because we haven't seen Gaza's, but probably better than Gaza's. Um, the Americans have soldiers training for that, and you can hear them talking about it. They're talking about wearing chemical suits because it's so dangerous with your weaponry, off-gassing. Um, so they're wearing these big, um, like, hazmat-type suits. They have gas masks. Um, they And they pass out. They have these special forces soldiers that are supposed to be, you know, the strongest, toughest um, in their army, and they're passing out. Um, they're disoriented, they're claustrophobic, as you can imagine. Um, and it's scary. It's deeply scary for them to do it, even if they're capable of doing it, which there's no sign um, so far that that, that that is the case. The enormity of the task to, you know, quote unquote, eradicate Hamas means you're going to be fighting down in this space for years. It, this is not a multi-day operation. But First they did. All, they did say your... they. They did say that they're planning for a long war, though. So is isn't this exactly what they're they're ready for? And Netanyahu yesterday gave a national address promising the Israeli people, yeah, there will be a a ground invasion. It's all planned. We're we're ready to go. We're just you know, we're doing it in our own time. So, is that all bluff, or is it? I mean, what? How, what you're saying and what they're saying are on opposite uh, poles, so to speak. Well, I mean, I think they're saying the same thing. When you read their tunnel, um, their tunnel experts are saying the same thing, that it's not clear. Um, you know, IDC Herzilia, which is the like leading security think tank, their, their tunnel uh, specialist, IDF tunnel specialist, didn't see uh, that this was a possible operation. American tunnel fighters, special forces, aren't saying that it's going to be, uh, that they've never seen it before. It's, yeah, it's possible it happens. The Israelis have thousands of soldiers that have been training for more than a decade, special forces units that have trained only for this. They spend all their time training for this operation. Um, and it's entirely possible that, uh, that they are prepared for it. I'm just saying we haven't seen that. We haven't seen any record of that in any of these wars where tunnels were a factor. They were a factor in South Lebanon in 2006. They were obviously a huge factor in 2014. The tunnels, the two tunnel operations, um, the one in Shajaiya and the one in Rafa, um, basically ended the ground operation. They were both so spectacular, uh, you know, visions of defeat for the Israelis. They were chasing their soldiers down into the, into the tunnels, assuming they had been caught. Um, going against the prohibition, and then they carried out the Hannibal Directive in both of those instances, um, because this it's 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 very difficult fighting, um, because we're theorizing uh, and speculating. I, my position is not that they cannot do it. Uh, if you want to spend ten years, um, if you want to ethnically cleanse the population so that you don't have resistance on the surface level. Um, Palestinians are preparing to fight them in the air. We've seen the suicide drones be used. Um, they're preparing to fight them up and down tall buildings. They're preparing to fight them on the street level. And they're preparing to fight them underneath the ground. So it's a very, very sophisticated operation that the Israelis are going to have to pull off that presumably they've been planning some time for. But the surprise attack of October 7th def definitely expedited uh, whatever plans they did have for an invasion, because the way Israel treats Gaza, it seemed like there wasn't going to be an invasion. They were going to lock the place shut with this very expensive fence that was going to just keep people trapped inside like they have always been. They could run, uh, you know, run sh uh, skeleton crews on a holiday, um, which is what th that they say was happening during that attack. Um yeah, it's 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 an enormous task. The thing that they're talking about to eradicate every Hamas fighter for generations to come, as Netanyahu said, um, is a very maximalist goal that um, in the most difficult terrain in the world, the ex CENTCOM chief said that it would be a bloodbath for both sides. So that's CENTCOM saying it's going to be a bloodbath for the Israelis. And I don't think that they're not hearing that in those meetings with the Americans. I, I have to assume that they're aware of that. And I guess the supposition for the Israelis is that they believe that they will somehow through intelligence or somehow discover the place where the captives are held. And then it's just a single operation to get down into that room. But 
we don't know that they know where they are. And so, oh, and it seems unlikely. It seems unlikely that they would all be held in the same place as well. And they'll be in different places. They'll be yeah. above and below ground, um, and you'll have people preparing to fight in in that video that we saw. There's not enough room. You're single file. Um, you know, you're not bringing motorcycles down there, but Palestinians have motorcycles down there. You don't have command and control if you're the Israelis because you can't use your radios underground, but Palestinians have command and control because they have uh, secure phone lines, uh, self-contained phone lines, which should give them command and control throughout the entire war, which at times the Israelis won't have because when they're working in an urban environment, their radio signals are going to be blocked by high buildings and by the, the towers that they dropped on top of people um, the concrete and rebar and people's lives are breaking up their radio streams and their vaunted network connectivity. Um, it's a very, very difficult fight that they're promising. Um, it's a brutal fight. And it's a fight that maybe by the time they've uh, killed the number of people necessary to do this brutality, that gassing people by the end, uh, they might think that that's a normal thing to be talking about. But I would suggest that it it says that Delta Force is out of ideas. If they're using Delta Force as the, uh, you know, as the ostensible authors of these plans, um, it, it seems to me to show a lack of a plan more than it does something um, reasonably possible. I don't, I, I think that you, I mean, we've seen gas used in the subway systems um, in Japan and in New York, and it, 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 it impacts one, station but it doesn't penetrate down the line and go all through the entire network to such a degree that all the fighters fall to you know fall dead and you just step over them on the way to save the day um, you're exposed to that gas too um, presumably um, so it's it's difficult to know how they would do it even if it was one objective if they found the spot it was one objective they drilled down a hole inserted it um, somehow with gas it can't be done by flooding which is the other part of that story there's not enough pressure to do that and it also presupposes that you can pre-position your infrastructure in the middle of a war zone for long periods of time because the soldiers that go down in the tunnels they need to be replenished they need to be uh, they need to rotate in and out because you can't go down um, for long periods of time they they pass out they, they're not good at using their breathing apparatuses they only have an hour of air um, there's all kinds of difficulties um, and all kinds of defensive advantages for the palestinians in the tunnel network to fight in the tunnel network itself, there's also significant advantages to having your command and control completely underground um, during this whole war. The Palestinians haven't had that kind of long-term stable leadership that hasn't been assassinated. Hmm. Um, but 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 Gaza has that and has had that for you know seven or eight years. I guess Jabari was the last assassination, which is like 2012. It's it's so. It's uh, the Palestinians have significant advantages in the tunnel network. 